And good evening. Welcome to the Bible study. Glad to have you with us on uh, Wednesday. I have to share this with you. On Monday, I ran across an article that I thought I would kind of show you a headline to. That it just, some things when you read them, they just make you laugh. And so I thought I'd try to bring a smile to you this evening. But on Monday, I was reading through some news and this headline came up. It said, man chasing fly accidentally blows up part of his house. The explosion destroyed the kitchen and partly damaged the roof. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read a headline like that, man chasing fly accidentally blows up part of house, I've got to read the article to know what happened. And so this is, when I saw it, here's what it says. A man in France was injured Friday after he blew up part of his home while trying to kill a fly with an electric swatter, according to reports. The man, who was in his 80s, was about to eat dinner when he spotted the insect. He picked up the bug-killing racket and started swatting at it. Unaware, a gas canister was leaking from the home, located in the village of, uh, I think it's Parc Hole Chenaud, uh, in southwestern France, according to the BBC. A reaction from the electric swatter and gas caused an explosion that destroyed his kitchen and partly damaged the roof. He managed to escape the blast with only light burns to his hand and was transported to a local area hospital. The residence is currently uninhabitable due to the collapsed roof, according to the French newspaper Sud Oust. Meanwhile, the unidentified man has since checked into a local campsite as his family attempts to repair the house. It is not clear what happened to the fly. So I thought that just made me laugh when I read it on Monday, and I thought you might get a kick out of it. Uh, ladies, you can laugh at us men over that type thing because I've probably done things about as unwise, though he did it a little bit in ignorance, but it just made me laugh. Hey, glad to have you with us tonight, and uh, trust you've got your Bibles. Be ready to follow along in our Bible study in just a little bit. As we begin, let me start by telling you our missionaries of the week. It's, it's the Chattanooga Rescue Mission. It's right here in our city. Helps a lot with the homeless and providing food and shelter and clothing and an opportunity. When I was looking up the, some things about it, getting ready to come to tonight, I found a, te a testimony. And uh, the testimony is from a lady named Gia who uh, is giving back to the mission as a volunteer because of what the mission has meant to her. And her testimony is actually in two parts on their website. So what we're going to do is I'm going to let you hear the first part of her testimony. Then we'll kind of give you a couple other prayer requests. And then we'll come back and listen to part two of her testimony. But this is part of what the Chattanooga Rescue Mission does. We support them. We use them when there are times when people have need. And so I want you to listen to Gia's testimony. And then after that, we'll give you some other prayer requests. Then you'll see the other part of her testimony this evening. I think this is about maybe three, three and a half minutes, something like that. But watch with me as Gia tells her story. Um, well, my name is Gia Baralbi, and the question is, why do I want to give back to the China University Mission? And it uh, starts many years ago. I feel very passionate in giving back to the Chattanooga Rescue Rescue Mission um, because they were there for me um, with love and without wanting anything except for just to love on me with God um, when I was so broken. I'm in this cycle of making really bad decisions with nowhere to go, and I didn't know God. Um, it was 2007 and 8, and um, I left a, an abusive husband with the clothes on my back and to take care of my mom, and she ended up in a nursing home. And so I ended up on the streets. And um, in a cycle of uh, 
alcohol and drugs and then I'm in trouble in trouble with the law and um, I couldn't break that and um, an outreach uh, minister of yours came with a sandwich and I didn't know about you all at all um, and really I didn't know about God like I didn't know anybody would do anything uh, without wanting something um, and uh, I didn't even have an ID and so um, in staying places where there were just kind of horrible conditions you all took me in and you gave me a warm place to stay and a clean bed and some food and um, the Word of God um, and showed me that um, through the love of God that there was um, a better way than what I was living and uh, I took that with me and started to rebuild my life and um, my mom died and I fell off and made some bad decisions and was able to come back to the rescue mission again <laughs> with open arms and um, it started again um, and really began to get to know God uh, because um, what I saw was just this uh, different form of or definition of love than what I had ever known. And that great testimony, we'll hear the other part of it in just a moment. But uh, that's part of what the, the rescue mission does. Now, uh, as far as within our church family and extended family, we have some prayer requests just to mention to you. Number one, Judy Key had to be taken back to the hospital. She's having trouble uh, with her breathing in that. So Brother Buddy has taken her back to the hospital. She's in the hospital at, uh, at Memorial, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, Judy Camp had to be taken to the hospital on yesterday. And... Um, so uh, she had to be taken to the hospital on yesterday. And uh, so be praying for that family. And then also the family of James Dempsey. That is Connie Seal's father. Uh, the visitation was today for him. Uh, I don't know how many of you got word ahead of time, but do be praying for Connie and the family with uh, his passing and I know that they would appreciate that. So these are some of the needs within our church family and extended church family. Be praying for the services on Sunday. Had a wonderful service last week with partaking of the Lord's Supper and being able to do that even in, in recognizing the social distancing. We had a great service. So God bless you for that. Thank you for being in your place. And let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll see the other part. I tell you what, let's go ahead and watch the other part of the mission uh, uh, testimony from Gia, and then we'll have a word of prayer before we get into our Bible study. So we kind of left off, that was the first part, now here's the second part. What I saw was just this uh, different form of, or definition of love than what I had ever known. Um, and so, uh, I'm in school now, I'm sober, now I'm in school now, and um, I'm in trauma therapy, and uh, I'm going to school for communications to be a freelance grant writer, uh, to find money for organizations like you all. It's outside of the spectrum of federal grant money. Because along the way, um, I, my husband was uh, a well-to-do person, and along the way, I saw a lot of, I came into a lot of problems in trying to get help, or like I said, just wanting something, and I saw a lot of waste with funds. And it broke 
my heart. Uh, and I've been on both sides of the fence, I guess, for Rodeo Elements. And so um, now that I am planted in the Lord and uh, moving forward, it's important for me to come back. Um, for people to see that uh, God can change your life, and that He is faithful, and that um, He takes the broken to make unbelievable statements in life, and um, I am at Chattanooga State, and I a disability and I'm a tutor and I am a global scholar and I have a 4.0 and I, it's just amazing the things that God has done and it started, the seed really started here. So have this passion to give back here. And that's why I'm going to here. What a great testimony that is of uh, what the mission does, and so we appreciate that. Uh, Judy Keith, I, I think I may have said Memorial, she's in uh, Parkridge on Macaulay. So do uh, keep her in prayer and Judy Camp, the family of James Dempsey, that's Connie Seal's father, and then also our missionary, our mission work of the week which is the Chattanooga Rescue Mission. Let's have a word of prayer, and then after that, we'll get into our studies. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to uh, be able to gather around your word and look at it. Even as we're online, Lord, I pray that you would bless our time together, use it to strengthen us. May we apply the truth of your word in practical ways to our life so that we live out our faith in a way that you're glorified. We'll thank you for all you do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to call your attention to one word, one verse, and then within that verse, there's one particular word that we're going to kind of use for our time together this evening. Take your Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, most people, when they think of 1 Corinthians 13, they think of the word love or charity, which is uh, the key word of this chapter. As you come to the end of this chapter, the apostle Paul as he's writing, he puts, he says this, he says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul lists three abiding truths or concepts in this verse. The first one is faith, we see listed there, and uh, so you can mark that, mark that verse that word. The second is the word hope. And then the final one is the word charity. Those three words are, are key words, and he's sharing the fact that they are abiding things. Then, of course, he finishes by saying the greatest of these is charity. He's come out of chapter 12 by saying, hey, look, I sh I'm showing you a better way. And he talks about how important that love is, that agape love, that charity as we have in our Bible. But tonight we're going to look at one of the other words, and it's that middle one. It's the word hope that I've got circled there. The word hope. And I want to give you some things about it that's very important as we look at this word and maybe take some practical truths from it. The first thing to know about hope is it's used, in the, it's used as both a noun and a verb. Now, I know right now some of you are thinking, oh, preacher, not again. We're back to English class. What is it about you and English classes? Well, I think it's important to know this. Hope can be used as a noun, and it can be used as a verb. As a verb is, I, I hope to do something. I hope this. I hope that. As a noun, we have this hope. So it can be used both ways. The second thing to note about the word hope is the biblical concept of it is different from our modern concept. Our common modern concept, we think of hope as a suspect 
thing. I hope to be able to do this. I hope that this will come to pass. I hope I don't run out of gasoline before I get to the gas station. I hope my parents will let me come over and hang out on Friday night. I hope we win the game. And it's a it's it's something that is in question. It's kind of more the modern concept of it. But in the Bible, it is a more concrete uh, assured thing and we're going to look at that this evening. So the biblical concept is different from the modern from the common modern concept in this word hope. The third thing that I want you to know about it kind of is leading in to looking at some verses on it is that faith and hope are related truths. Faith and hope are related truths. Now they're related in this way. Faith is a present confidence. Now we're going to look we'll look here in just a moment at some verses for you. Faith is a present confidence. You've heard me give you the definition that faith is confidence that God will do what he promised. Faith is in the present. It is a present confidence. Hope is a future anticipation. So faith is in the present. Hope is in the future. You say, now preacher, why do you say that? Because look at Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. It gives you this. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25. Just back one book from where we were just a moment ago. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes. This is a great verse. This is a verse that says, "For we." this is a chapter that says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. The book starts off by talking about there is there, and now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ. A lot of great truths in here. But when he comes to verses 24 and 25, and he has, he's prepared this by talking about how that we groan and that nature itself groans in anticipation of the deliverance that's coming. It groans wanting to be delivered. We are waiting that adoption uh, that is to come for us. But when he comes to verse 24, he says this, for we are saved by hope. Okay, now catch this. We are saved by hope, but then he says this, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So catch this truth. Faith is in the present tense. Faith is my living my life today with the confidence that God will do what he promised. Faith is in the present tense. Hope is a future anticipation whereby I haven't seen it yet, it hasn't come to fulfillment yet, but I still believe that God is going to do it. Hope is in the future. He says as much as says, look, once hope gets here, it's no longer hope. I have a hope of heaven. Once I'm there, it'll be a reality. Right now, it's an anticipation that is still a fact, but it's something that is out in the future, so much so that he says that we wait for it. So we're talking about that word hope. Now, when we look at that, this this concept, this truth of hope, there are maybe there are maybe three New Testament concepts that are worth considering along the lines of this term. So I'm going to give you some verses. We're going to turn with them, turn to them, and look at them. We'll try to move as as smoothly and as quickly as we can. But I want to give you three New Testament concepts about this word hope. The first one is this. There is an anticipation of hope. An anticipation of hope. And that anticipation is that that which we are waiting for is good. There is a good thing that we are waiting for. Notice if you would, and first of all, you'll see some verses we'll give you here. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5 is the first one. He says, For we, through the Spirit, wait 
for the hope of righteousness by faith. That is something that we are, we are waiting for when God will finally deliver us out of these sin-cursed bodies. And there's a hope that we have for that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul, again writing, says here, uh, he says, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, and he puts it in here, the hope of salvation. Now, you say, what do you mean the hope of salvation? We understand that we have already been saved. We've already placed our faith in Jesus Christ. And in that, we know that our sins have been forgiven. We're no longer in danger of condemnation. But we also know that we continue to struggle with, these, with this flesh with the, with the wars within our members, but we have this hope that we're looking forward to when we'll be delivered from the power of sin, from the presence of sin. We'll, we'll, we'll be eternally delivered and we'll see the finalization of our salvation. And so when he talks about that, he said, look, that is something, it's an anticipation, something I'm looking forward to, something that's good, but it's out there in the future. Notice, turn over just a few pages in your, if it's like in my Bible, just a few pages over to Titus, the book of Titus, chapter 1. And he's, as Paul opens here, he says, The servant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. And then he says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He said that hope of eternal life. We're looking forward to it. In verse 7 of chapter 3, he says a similar thing, being then, uh, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, it's an anticipation that is still out in the future of something that is good in this case that eternal life that we'll know when we make our way into eternity and then back in chapter 2 and verse 13 he says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ so the first thing about this word hope is there is an anticipation of hope whereby we are looking forward with assurance to that which is good, to something which is good. The second thing we find is there is a foundation of our hope. And the foundation of our hope is the resurrection of Christ. There's a foundation to it. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we just looked in chapter 13 as we were starting, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, verses 17 through 19, Paul is writing, if you remember in 1 Corinthians, he talks about the gospel at the beginning, and evidently there were some there in Corinth that were uh, denying the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, and the resurrection as a reality. Maybe they had been influenced by the Sadducees of this day, but they were denying the resurrection. Paul gives that horrible thought, if Christ be not risen, how horrible that is. In verse 17, he says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So he says, listen, if Christ did not rise from the dead, if there is no resurrection of Christ, there is no hope for the future. The very foundation of the hope that we have is the resurrection of Christ. And then he says in verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Do you know what the foundation of the hope that we have? Now keep in mind, faith is in the present. It's my confidence that God will do what he said. 
Hope is something that I'm looking for with assurance and anticipation for the future. He says, if Christ is not raised, there is no hope. There's no hope. Our religion is vain. Our faith is vain. Our loved ones who have died are perished, are gone. It's over. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no foundation for the hope that we have. And then, of course, he comes to verse 20. I love it. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Number one, we have the anticipation of hope. It's anticipating those things which are good, a new life a new home, a freedom from sin, a freedom from the, from the scourge of this world and these sin-cursed bodies. It is looking toward that thing which is hope, which is good. It's a blessed hope. It's a lively hope. We're looking forward. It's an anticipation of that which is good. There's a foundation. The foundation of all of it is based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The third thing that we see as you study hope, the third, third concept in the New Testament is the source of our hope is God himself. The source of our hope is God himself. The anticipation of our hope is that which is good. The foundation of our hope is a resurrection of Christ. And the source of our hope is God himself. Notice back in Romans chapter 15... In Romans chapter 15, as the Apostle Paul is writing, and he comes to verse 13, and he says this. He says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He's called here the God of hope. Uh, the testimony that we saw from the rescue mission and really the work of what they do is to take those who many times are not only homeless, they're hopeless. And they're, to sh they're showing them that in God, they can have hope. He is the source of hope that can overcome the hopelessness of their situation. Romans 15, 13, what a great verse. Back in 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians and chapter uh, 1, as the Apostle Paul is making his opening comments there, and he gives, of course, his normal Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus and the church at Thessalonica, verse 1. In verse 2, we give thanks always for you all. And then in verse 3, he says this, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, now catch this, and patience of hope, but catch the next little phrase, that prepositional phrase, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father. You know what he was reminding them of? The source of hope is God himself. He's the one that gives us that hope. Finally, in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, again, that idea of hope. By that, two, uh, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. In God, we have a hope. We have a hope that is an anchor for our soul. So this concept of hope now abideth. These three things, these three things abide. Faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, love. We've talked before about love. That is acting the best interest of another. God acted in our best interest. We talked about faith. It's a confidence that God will do what he promised. But this idea of hope, what when we look at that anticipation and that foundation and that source, 
What practically can we put into our lives with it? Let me give you three things in closing tonight. How does that work in my life? How does this hope then, it's something that's in the future, it's something that I'm anticipating, but yet I am assured of, how does it work in my life? Let me give you three things. I kind of pinned down as I was studying, getting ready for tonight. Number one, when I understand hope, my present circumstance is not permanent. I will look beyond it. My present circumstance is not permanent. In hope, I know my present circumstance isn't permanent, and I can look beyond it. I will look beyond it. Sometimes in the present, things can seem so daunting. In the present, the suffering can seem so great. But when I lay hold of hope, I know this. My present circumstance is not permanent. And I can look beyond it and know that regardless of what may happen here on earth, there's something greater ahead. There's something good ahead. There's something that God is doing that is ahead. Number one, my present circumstance is not permanent. And let me ask you, what are you dealing with right now that just seems like it's just weighing down on you so much? Can I tell you this? It's not permanent. It is not permanent. You can look beyond it. Number two, the second thing with this concept of hope, there is more to life than this life. I will not cling to the temporal. There is more to life than this life. I will not cling to the temporal. You see, in hope, I begin to understand the bigger picture. And as I understand the bigger picture, I know this. There's more to life than what I'm living right now. There's more to life than this mortal time that I am. Just like in 1 Corinthians, when when. Paul wrote about those that had passed away. If there's no resurrection of the dead, our, our loved ones who have passed away have perished and there's no hope. But there is a resurrection and there's something greater to look toward. And this life becomes more than just the physical aspect of where I am today. And it makes it easier for me to let go and not cling to that which is temporary. Sometimes we can fall so in love with things that will deteriorate and rot and rust and pass away. But in hope, I understand there is more to life than this life. The third truth that I want you to take with you from this and apply it to your life. My God is aware and he will be faithful. Now listen to that statement. When I understand hope, and when I lay hold of hope, I know this, my God is aware, and he will be faithful. I will trust him to know and to do what is best. How many times do you read the accounts of those Christians in the Bible? I'm sure there were circumstances that many times they didn't understand. They, didn't, they weren't able to see what God was doing, but yet such magnificent things came from it when they, when they, when they believed that God was aware and that he would be faithful. And God did something magnificent. Think of the apostle John. What must it have been like when he got banished to Patmos? Boy, you talk about a lonely feeling. You're put away on a, on a rocky island and banished from people. But yet, John trusted him. The Bible says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And God revealed himself in a way, and John penned the book of the Revelation. You know why? Because he believed that God was aware and that he would be faithful and he trusted him to know and to do what was best. 
You read about it all through Scripture, whether it was Daniel facing the lion's den or the three Hebrew boys facing the fiery furnace. Whatever it was, in so many circumstances, the apostle Paul, when he prayed and asked God to take away the thorn in the flesh, but God said, that's not my plan. Instead, I'm going to be faithful and show you that my grace is sufficient for you. Throughout Scripture, you find that because of hope, because of the assurance of that which was still out in the future, those Christians believed that God was aware that he would be faithful. And because of that, because of their hope, they trusted him to know and to do what was best. Let me ask you, what is it that you're dealing with right now? And sometimes you just wonder, does God even know? Is God aware? Find him faithful. Lay a hold of hope. That anticipation, that foundation, that source that's in God. Believe him. And know this. In hope, I can look forward even when my present circumstance seems dark. Three abiding things, faith, hope, and charity. What is hope? Hope is an assurance of something while it's still out in the future, while you still can't see it, while you haven't been able to embrace it, why you may not fully understand how it's going to work out, you're still looking toward it and believing God. And when I look forward in anticipation and believe Him in hope, it allows me in faith to trust Him to keep His promises today. Hey, I hope that's something that will help you with whatever you're going through right now. Trust you're praying for the services on Sunday and asking the Lord to do a work in our midst. Let me just ask you, hey, be in prayer. There are a couple of visits I've made this past week. I'll be following up on this week. And God is working in the lives of some people. And really, it's an answer to prayer for some challenges I've given the church. And so I wish you'd be praying that, those, that God will just work in hearts and lives and make himself known in such a way that we can be a blessing. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Be praying for the services. Be in your place. Some of you maybe that haven't been coming, would love to see you back at the Lord's house. See you in your place on Sunday morning. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this evening. I thank you for your word and the hope that we have as believers. We have a hope of heaven. We have a hope of victory. We have a hope of a home one day where there'll be no more parting. May we rest in patience as we await the realization of, those, of that hope. May we live with an anticipation of it. May we understand the precious assurance we have in the resurrection of Christ. God, may you show yourself to us in such a way that we will know that you are aware, that you are active in our lives. Well, thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name.